Have you tried restarting the computer? Maybe. I did. That's what the first thing I did this morning. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I really noticed it when I um when I when my computer uh downloading um evil is got really slow. I'm like, oh my god. So I began the session on on YouTube. So I don't know if you want to go over there. Yep, I'll go check on it now. Yeah, cool. Uh, there we go, Mastering Library Editor. I want to go into it. No, Q, cancel. All right, I'm in. Um, I'm sharing my screen, but um, I, on YouTube, it, I don't know if it's heavy latency. Well, the screen is showing up blank on YouTube. Um, no, it, it shows up. Oh, there now I'm seeing evil on um, over here. Yeah, latency isn't isn't that bad, Ed. It's about a few few seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm seeing the control panels that you have up right now, right? That is correct. Yeah, so it's possible then it's just me on on my my stream of YouTube. So I, you let me know. Will do. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be starting in a couple minutes. I see the, the room is kind of building, so I'm just going to let it uh, go on uh, for a few minutes. So those that are joining us already uh, would like to really you know, know where, where are you located? Where are you from? Where's home at? Just to let you know, Jorge and myself, we're out at, we're out of South Florida. So um, Jorge is a little closer than Miami. I'm just a tad north of there. And um, as as many other people around the world, you know, uh, we are we are currently working from home. So it's been a couple of weeks since I see you, or I think, or more. Been more. I think I've been working from home. I think yeah, this week is a month. Yeah, it's gonna be almost a month. Wow. For me, I think you you worked at the office. I think two more weeks before. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, since I had just gotten back from India, yeah, I stayed there a little bit longer. You know, the the biggest thing I, I miss from the office is that the 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 stand up desk. <laughs> I I really like working uh, standing up. I mean, the good thing is at home you can you know stand up, walk around a little bit, then come back. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Wow, from Kenya, Simon. Wow, nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you for for being here. Greatly appreciate it. That is awesome. You know, so my name, just just in case those that don't haven't um, we haven't met in the past or or chatted with you or through the forums, my name is Edwin Robledo. 
I'm part of the Fusion 360 and, and Eagle out of this Eagle team. I've had the opportunity to be working with Eagle for a very long time. And with us today, uh, Jorge, he will be commenting as well as uh, running the chat on Fusion as well as on Zoom. I'm sorry, <laughs> on uh, on YouTube as well as on on our um, a Zoom um, registration page. Uh, he will be taking care of that and um, and you know and and adding his his usual uh, a commentary as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and begin the presentation and. Um, uh, I think we're going to be a, just a little over 30 minutes for the material that I have prepared today. So let's go ahead and begin then. So as you can see on my screen right now, I just have the Eagle control panel and um, I have the home tab enabled. And this is what Eagle looks like when you actually launch it. Um, just to let you know, I am working on a Mac. So um it, yours, if you're on a Windows, it may look just a tad different, but it shouldn't be that big of a difference. Okay, so in today's webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, libraries and, and how to work with libraries and how to create libraries. Um, I'm not going to go into really elaborate examples because it's, it's really time consuming, but we'll do an example which is very typical. And if yours is a lot more elaborate than that, it, it's just a matter of just following those same steps. It's all it really is. So uh, first of all is in the, in the Eagle control panel, this is the screen that you're on in now, you'll notice that we have a library folder up here on top, okay? And if I expand this, you'll see that you have uh, a list of the libraries. These that have that little symbol that look like persons there, that means that that's a managed library, and this is actually this is actually a managed folder. Uh, that that's what that little symbol means. It's a lab. It's a managed folder, and it just it what it means is that it's it's shared. The libraries there are shared with other members uh, of a particular team. So somebody created that that managed folder and added me as part of that folder. And I have access to those libraries. So everybody, every member of this team has access to these libraries. So we have this one here. We have, when we did a, a trade show um, earlier this year, this is my own personal managed library. So your own personal managed library is going to have your name on it. So this is my own personal library. Um, and these are just different other ones that we have. Now, where it says... Um, uh, where it says manage library right here, this one right here, if I expand this, here you're gonna see the managed libraries that are available, that are um, contributed by our team of librarians, as well as some companies such as distributors and manufacturers that we have given them special access to our public uh, or community domain um, a, a manage libraries so you could actually see their uh, see libraries and they're managing it it's not like we manage it so the only ones that we manage are the ones under the managed folder called eagle pcb as well as fusion electronics you'll see other ones and i'll demonstrate that now so let's go there i'll just right click on libraries and go here where it says open library manager okay and if we go to available Okay, let me make sure that I am online. No, I am online, okay. Open library manager. Oh, okay, is that I, I have a lot of libraries available. So these are all the libraries that we have available. Um, so the ones from Eagle PCB, these are all the libraries that our librarian team creates as well as the ones called Fusion Electronics that's actually created by our team of librarians. Um, and if we go and here is from PCB layout, you know, the ones that they've created and I currently have in use. These are the libraries that I have currently in use. So when I'm working on a schematic or a board, I have them in use. If I wanna get rid of some of these libraries, I'm not deleting them. Just that when I'm using the act man in a schematic, I don't really need access to them. I could actually select them and select here, it's removed. It doesn't mean I'm deleting them. It's just I'm getting kind of like getting them out of the way, okay? 
and you know, here from worth as well. And if I go to the available tab, you'll see that we have many libraries here. that you have here that you actually want to get access to the only thing you need to do is just select the library that you want Ed, you to drop, use you dropped out for a second i mean you're 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 back now just letting you know that you dropped out for a second so you may have to repeat oh, the last I'm two sorry. minutes okay so um i was yes um uh, reviewing uh, how to access libraries? I just right click and go to open library manager. Um, in use, these are the current libraries that I have in use. So when I'm working on a schematic, these are the libraries I see. If I don't want to see these libraries, doesn't mean I want to delete them. I still want to see them. I could highlight the library and select here where it says remove. Doesn't mean I'm, I'm deleting it. It's just I'm removing it from when I use the use command. Okay. Now the available tab has additional libraries that are currently available, as I said earlier, contributed by distributors, manufacturers. So we have some from PCB Layout, we have from Fusion 360, which is our team of librarians, as well as uh, Eagle PCB. We have from Seed Studio, Adafruit, SparkFun. And um, I like to point out the ones where I PCB Layout as worth the ones from Worth, which Worth, I think, contributed at least 100 libraries. Uh, the nice thing of their libraries is that they actually include the 3D model with the majority of them, which is really, really. Apparently, I was uh, cut out again, uh, Jorge. Yeah. Yeah, I just saw it happen right now. Okay. So um, the last thing I want to say about libraries on, um, on the control panel is that if you expand the libraries, the same way I showed you that you could go to the library manager, the same way you go to the library manager and you could select the libraries and remove them, that way you don't see them when you're doing the add command in the, um, in the schematic editor. You also could expand the libraries and you see these little dots next to the name of each library. You notice that some of them are green, some of them are gray. The gray ones is when I do the add command, they won't show up. Okay, so it looks like Ed's internet is continuing to have issues. So what we'll do is I'll I'll go ahead and take over from here. And that way we don't keep getting the, the interruption. So I'll let him know when he's back in. Ed? Ed? Uh, Jorge, I think it might be best if you maybe take over the presentation. Yeah, that's what I was um, telling telling the... I, yeah, because I think I'm, my internet is very unstable. So I'm going to stop sharing. I think I already did stop sharing. Yeah, you did stop sharing it. So I'll, I'll take care of it from here. Okay. So, okay. So, um, so, so let me know when you're on the, when you're on the YouTube that way. I'll I'll... go ahead and take care of the chat then. Um, Alrighty. So give me one second. Okay. So as I was mentioning, we get libraries from many different distributors that are included. Um, most of those have their 3D models already mapped, so we don't have to worry about that. 
and that makes life easier for you when you use those designs as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So let me know if everybody can see it. Okay. If you can post through the YouTube and now when Ed jumps back in, you can confirm. Uh, I'm on YouTube. Okay. Can you see my screen? Um, I'm sharing the control panel right now in preview yeah, mode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see it. Yeah. We see it. Okay, cool. So, Let's go ahead and go through an example of a component that we can make. Now, making a library is very easy. You just go File, New, Library. OK, and that will create the library for you. And then what you can do is it'll open up a window like this one. OK, and you'll see all these columns. And it may look like it's a lot of windows, but it's actually very straightforward. So basically, these four columns are the four different types of elements you can have in a library. You can have a symbol, which is a schematic representation. You can have a footprint, which is the PCB representation. You can have a 3D package, which is the 3D model of the footprint. And then you have a device, which is the marriage of all those other different types of components mapped one to the other. OK, so the device is the glue that puts everything else together. So over here on the far right, this is basically the preview window. When you click on different elements, you'll see the, you'll get a preview over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Now there's multiple ways to create your libraries. You don't have to design everything from scratch. That's something that a lot of new users worry about, where it seems intimidating to have to design a footprint from scratch. But really because of the amount of standardization that there is in the electronics industry, you can really reuse a lot of footprints. So for copying existing footprints into your library, which is a very common thing you'll be doing, there's many ways to do it. The one I find easiest is to go to the footprint column. You see right here, the button at the bottom says add footprint. Go ahead and left click it. And you're gonna see that you can type in a name for a new footprint or you can use the import function. So click on import. And then what you do is you find the footprint you wish to import. Now you can search for it, obviously. So in our case, maybe I want uh, dual inline 16, very common through hole. You'll see that many libraries in Eagle contain this footprint. So I can pick any of them. There's also something that's noteworthy is the ref packages library. Okay, so we have two of them. One of them is long pad, the other one it doesn't say long pad. These are very useful libraries for footprints. Basically, the only thing they contain are footprints, and they serve as basically a, a source, as, as something that you can pull from into your personal libraries with these footprints that have been in Eagle for many, many years. Um, that doesn't mean they're all 100% accurate. We're not suggesting that. But they have been around for a long time, and we do have a certain amount of confidence in them. Since we're on this subject, it's important that you always verify your footprints. You want to make sure that they're accurate because at the end of the day, the responsibility falls on the designer to make sure that everything is accurate. If you use a third party library and by third party is anything that you didn't make yourself, you take the risk that there may be an error in that library. So keep that in mind whenever you're going to reuse, make sure to always double check. Obviously as, you work with Eagle and you get experience, you start building up these footprints and these libraries that you trust because you've used them before with success. So here, as you'll notice in the ref packages library, both, both of them don't have any 3D models mapped, but some of the other ones do. So I'm gonna use one that kind of has the 3D model already mapped. And you can see here in the preview, you have the footprint 2D representation for the layout, and then you have the 3D model. So I'm gonna say, okay, Bring that one in, okay. And there's our footprint. You'll notice that it should bring the uh, the 3D model with it as well. So we go over here. Okay, no, it didn't bring it with it. Just brought the footprint. So from here, you can go ahead and edit, make modifications, and adjust it for your purposes. So as you can see, being able to reuse an existing footprint is going to save you a lot of time. So something we definitely recommend. Now, let's say you can't use an existing footprint, or like in this case, you don't have a 3D model. 
but it's something that's standardized. It's something that um, is specified by the IPC, which many surface mount components are. Then another option is to use the package generator. So you can do that over here. You go to the 3D package column. You click create with package generator. You select if you have if you're if you're part of multiple managed folders, you're going to select which one you want this uh, footprint to be sorry this package to be created in. And if you make this a managed library, which we will, you'll also determine which folder it'll be in. So let's say support team libs. I'll say OK. And then what you'll notice is you have this kind of calculator or wizard based approach. So you just find the type of component you want to make. Let's say you want to make this one. 16, which is the number of pads this component in particular that we'll be practicing with has. So 16. And then you put in the dimensions. And this you can read off the data sheet. OK, the component we're going to be pl playing with today, by the way, let me go ahead and see if I can add a modal dialogue taking over. OK, we're going to be making this one. OK, and I, I just picked this kind of randomly. This is the LM13700. It's basically a dual operational transconductance amplifier. So in, in, in a very, very simplified explanation this is basic think of it like an op amp but you can control the gain with a with a current okay it's basically what it is and again very very basically i'm kind of omitting some things but as a very basic explanation think of it that way it's basically an op amp whose gain is controlled by a current or it's proportional to a current hence transconductance okay so just chose this, and we're going to build a symbol for this component, OK? But it comes in a 16-pin dip and in a 16-pin SOIC. So by using the package generator to make that, I'm going to take advantage and get both the 3D model and the footprint made at the same time. So if we go over here. It's already set up for 16 pins. I'll say update preview. OK, we'll give it a second. And now, if we zoom out, 16 pin, the line footprint, name and value. Now, if I say finish, because I'm happy with this, you're going to see it'll be created, be downloaded for the package parameters. That's OK. We say OK. Now, it's going to get a long name. And some people maybe don't like the name being that long. The reason it is the way it is is that the IPC standard does specify a naming convention, which includes all of the information about the footprint. So it'll give you like width, length, things like that. And that's why you get this really long name here. OK, if you want to use a different name, then you shouldn't start directly from the package generator. There's another workflow that allows you to preserve the name of the footprint you want to associate. OK, so you can see here we have this 3D package. We have this one, but there's no ability to assign a, a, a 3D package for this one, the one that I imported. The reason for that is that this library is not currently managed. Once it becomes managed and I create a new version, you'll see that in 3D package, I'll get another another entry. And by default, it's just going to be an empty rectangle matched to the limits of the footprint size. But then by double clicking it, I can change it. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's make this library managed. So I'm going to first save it. OK, today is the 23rd, I believe. On save. Now we go to library. I want to say create managed library. Now what this does is this is going to copy this local library to the cloud, do some transformations on it so that it can reference other 3D content, and then it's going to be downloaded again. OK, at that point, the original local copy is going to be archived, which is what you see here in this checkbox. 
If you want to leave the original library where it's at, you can uncheck that. I don't recommend doing that because it can create confusion because what will happen is in the add dialog, you'll see the same library pop up twice. One of them will be the local unmanaged library, and then the other one will be the cloud managed library. So by doing the archive, you avoid confusion. You'll notice that here in manage folder, you can specify which one you want it to go to. Um, I'll have it go to support team libs. I'll say create. Now I'll manage library, say okay. You'll see how it created this other entry. Now if I go into that entry, what you're gonna see is just an empty rectangle waiting for me to assign a 3D model to it, okay? And we can do it again using the package generator. You can also upload, if you have a step model from the manufacturer, you can upload it and use it, or you can add from the existing database of models that are included with library.io. So these are the public models, there are many of them, and then you have the ones that you've created so far, okay? So lots of options here, it's very easy. Now you'll notice that it says version one. Remember how I mentioned that when you make it a managed library, the local version gets copied to the cloud, gets modified, and then gets downloaded again, okay? At that point, you now have this local copy of the managed library and you're making changes to it, but they're not immediately transferred back to the cloud. Okay, so you th this is kind of a manual push and pull type of situation as well. Um, although it's more push than pull really. So let's go ahead and, and show you what I mean by that. So at this point, I have my footprint. I have a 3D model that I'm happy with. I'm gonna go ahead and create a symbol. Okay, I'm gonna call this OTA, Operational Transconductance Amplifier. Create new symbol, yes. Okay, now at this point, if we look, and again, I have to do this because Zoom likes to be difficult. This is the symbol for an OTA. Okay, so it looks like an op amp. Just a couple little differences because you have these extra two diodes, which help linearize it. And then you have the bias input, which allows you to control the gain of the amplifier. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and draw these in. And I'm gonna freehand it, so it won't probably look as nice, but it'll serve the purposes and give the idea. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna use the line command. I want it to just be straight lines for now. I'll go over here. Let's do this, three, three. Uh, let's do that. Okay, perfect. So now- Just for reference, um, anything that has to do with, with graphical content when you're creating a schematic symbol, make sure that you're on the symbol layer. Um, it contributes no electrical information or any other data, it's just for graphical purposes. Okay, let me see what my grid is set to. Now a key point here, anything related to symbols or the schematic, you wanna to stick to a 0.1 inch grid. If you don't like imperial units, just switch it to metric. It'll become 2.54 millimeters. Just leave it alone, don't change the size. And the reason for that is all of the components in Eagle's built-in libraries are made to this grid. If you deviate from it, you're gonna find it very, sometimes very difficult to get things to connect properly. That's why we recommend not altering this. What I am gonna do though, is I'm gonna change the alternate grid because in order to make the little circles, I need to be able to use that half grid increment. So again, I'm in the circle command, hold down alt now. Okay, there's one. And now put in this one. No, actually no, it'll be like this. There we go, it'll be like that. I'm gonna draw another little line to make it to the grid, okay? And the reason for this is we want to stay on that 0 0.1 inch grid with everything we, we do. And that's especially important with the connection points. The art, it can be a little bit off, that's okay. But you don't want 
the the connection points to be off. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just put in some pins to figure out how I want to locate the two diode symbols. Okay, we have that. And then let's put one over here. Okay, that's all right. And I know you guys see all this weird text and probably think it looks ugly. We're going to work on that in a second. Um, what I need to put here is the diodes and those diodes look like, okay, they're going out from that point. Just wanted to make sure. So again, line command, use the alt key for something like this it comes in handy. Okay. Alt again. Okay, perfect. Okay, nice. You got some ability there, Jorge. I, I had not seen that part of you yet. No, no, no. I just picked a. I just picked a the right grid. That's all I did. I can't draw to save my life, actually. So I'll just do this. There we go. That's pretty good. And now we're still missing one, which we need to have on grid over here. So what I can do, I know, just to make it look better, I'll set it up so that uh, the bias pin ends up in the right place. It does not end up on the right place, but I'm not going to try to get it more perfect than that because then I'll need to do like quarter grid spacing. And that's yeah, we got the idea. It's okay. Okay, so I'll do that and I'll put in this one. Just put in a pin right here. Ah, it moved. So that's basically it. So let's go ahead now and we're going to rename these a little bit to change them and so that they look a little bit nicer. We don't need to see the name of the output. We don't need to see the name of this one here either. So a couple of ways you can do it. If you pick a pin, you'll see all its properties here. You can adjust visible so it only shows the pad number. Okay, it's one option. If you don't want to do them one at a time, what you can do is you can select multiple at the same time. So we have this one, we have this one. It will show you the attributes that they currently have in common and you can adjust them both together at the same time. So in this case also, I just want to see the pad and that's good. And then what I'll do with this is I'll make this a plus and a minus. And again, inspector is your friend. can make this type of stuff really easy. Um, we do have dedicated commands to making these changes. And if you have to make a lot of them, like in a schematic or a board, it can be easier to use those specific commands. But if you're just getting started with Eagle, um, there's a lot of power and a lot of functionality here in the inspector that can make life easier for you. Now, if you look, you're gonna notice that every little pin has this little circle on the end and it's, it has a number and then some text. Okay, the number indicates the swap level. So in other words, let's take, let's think of a resistor. A resistor has two pins, but it doesn't matter which way you connect the resistor. They are swappable, right? Well, that's what swap level is for. Zero means that the pin is unique, cannot be swapped. Numbers larger than zero will mean that any pins with the same number are swappable. So in the case of a resistor, 
you would set the two pins to some number greater than zero and the same number for both. So like if you look in the resistor libraries that ship with Eagle, you'll see that they have one and one. That means those two pins can be swapped. In this case, because of the nature of this component, nothing here is interchangeable. They're all unique. So we leave that, we leave that as is. Now, the text is used for the electrical rules checking and it gives Eagle an idea of what the pins function is. In this case, the default is IO, inputs and outputs. It doesn't have any special checks for input and output. However, for this component, we do know that some things are an input and some things are an output. So we can make that change. For example, we know these three pins are gonna be inputs. So I'll pick this one, hold control. I'm selecting these four all inputs. So I'll go over here, change IO to in. Okay, and we know that this one here is an output. So I'll select it and just set it to be out. Okay, and what this does is that Eagle, when you're using the component, does some checking. So if it sees, for example, that two outputs are connected together, that's more often than not a problem because they'll start pushing and pulling on each other. And then in the worst of cases, one of them will basically short the other one out. So you'd never, you, you never really want to see multiple outputs tied together. So that's something that the ERC can check. For the input, it'll check if, it's, if there's at least one output or a, some sort of a signal that's coming in. There's other directions that you could use. For example, you have no connect and C, which will obviously, if it sees any net touching the pin, it will flag a warning for it. Uh, open collector, power, which is important. The power pins are used um, to distribute power in a design and they have a special function. Power pins always expect to be connected to supply pins. Okay, any deviation from that will generate a warning in the ERC. Here you have passive direction, which also doesn't get any special checks. And then you have high input impedance, which I think has a couple of special checks, but I don't remember them right now. Okay, so right now we've almost completed our symbol. The only thing we're missing is to put in name and value placeholders. Again, you can see everything is on grid, even to the detriment of the appearance of the symbol right now. Okay, it's more important to be on grid than for the symbol to look pretty. Okay, so if, if you're rushing, that's that's the trade off you're going to make. Okay, be on grid. So for the text, you can obviously use a text command and just write it in. What I like to do is use a UOP that ships with Eagle called set name value. And what it'll do is automatically place the text for you on the correct layers. I'm going to put this one here. I'm going to put this one here. And I'm happy with that. Okay. So I'm going to now go ahead and go back to the symbol here. Now, one thing you notice, this doesn't have any power pins. The convention in Eagle is typically that whenever you have a multi-gated component, such as this one that we're dealing with today, you put the power pins as a separate gate. And what that allows you to do is to keep all of the signal flow on one schematic sheet. And then you can avoid cluttering up that clarity by moving the power pins to a separate sheet. So you'll have like a sheet showing like the circuit flow and then another sheet that has all the power connections and the bypass caps and all of that. And what that does is it makes the schematic easier to read. And the main goal with the schematic is to simplify understanding, make it as easy to follow as possible. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna make a little power pin symbol, which is super easy. Okay, I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna put this four up, four down. That's just arbitrary. I just picked, I just thought it would avoid the text clashing. Okay, you're gonna go ahead and name one VCC, let's say, or V plus or whatever the data sheet recommends or whatever your convention is. And then the key point here is you want to set its IO to be power. Okay, because that has a special function. 
power pins, number one, expect to always connect to supply pins. So if you just connect it as like a, a normal signal net, Eagle will actually flag a warning because that kind of indicates that something may not be correct. The other thing that's interesting about power pins is if you don't connect a supply pin to them, automatically all power pins with the same name connect. Okay, which in most cases is not desirable. It's not a desirable feature because it's an implicit connection. And most engineers like to see everything explicitly. Um, but it, it is how it works right now. Almost always it's not an issue because we always connect to a supply pin. And then the supply pin signal overwrites whatever this is. So we got that one. We set it to power. Now we'll pick this one. We'll call it, let's say ground. We'll set it to power as well. All right, that's good. And then all we need to do is just run that UOP again. If you right click on the UOP icon, it has history functionality. So it'll show you the ones you've run recently. Go ahead and select name and value. And there it is. Now we have our two gates. Now this particular component does have additional an additional set of gates, which is basically these Darlington transistors that it carries. Um, we're not going to make that part today because it's just extra time and, and it's going over something we've already seen. So let's go ahead and go to the table of contents again. And we see that we've made our OTA. We have our power pins. We have packages. We have footprints. The only thing we're missing is a device. Now I hit save. And when I did, you're going to see this as version one plus edits. Whenever you see plus edits, Eagle's letting you know, you've changed the local version of the managed library and those changes have not been reflected to the cloud version. And that's what this message is saying. We've really tried to emphasize that you need to create a new version and keep the two in lockstep. You basically need to push these local changes you've made up to the cloud. That's There's the also a, an icon on the bottom right hand corner of the status bar, which is blue which also indicates that uh, it needs an update. Correct. So at this point, we're going to go library, create a new version, say create. And now all of this is going to be pushed to the cloud. And you'll see that the version will now bump up to version 2. OK, so this is a very key point. You constantly have to be pushing changes up. If you make a whole bunch of changes in your local version, but you never push them, up to the cloud version. When you go into Fusion 360, you may find that things that you were expecting to have 3D models don't. And it's usually because of this, because users forget to create new versions. So at this point, let's go ahead and make a device. And the device is just mapping one to the other. So I'm gonna name the device what this is, 13700. I'm gonna say bad because it's missing the uh it's missing the two darlington pairs that are included in the in the in the device so in case i ever actually need to use this component i want to know that it's that it's the wrong one so we're going to go ahead and now add in now this component from the data sheet we know has two of these okay now one thing you should have noticed and i didn't mention it is that whenever you make a symbol you want to try to center it same thing with the footprint. Our convention in Eagle is to center the footprint, center the symbol. The reason for this is that wherever the origin is in the symbol editor, that's going to become the handle for the component in the schematic and in the board editors. So if you don't have the part centered, it can be difficult to figure out where you grab the component from. Okay, by having it be on the center, it becomes very easy to find it and, and select the component. Last thing we need to do is add in power pins. Go ahead and put them in here. OK. And now what we're going to do is we have these parameters down here. For prefix, prefix is what's going to be used when you bring the part into the design. So you'll see, you know, like in a resistor, we usually use R. So that way in the schematic, you see R1, R2, R3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For an integrated circuit such as this one, I typically like to use IC, but you can use whatever your preferred convention is. Now you notice here value is set to off, 
which is the default, but it has an on option, okay? If value set to off, what that means is that these value fields are going to show the name of the device, which in this case is LM13700 bad. Okay. For integrated circuits, this is desirable. It's one less thing you have to do because the value is already going to automatically be set for you. For passives, obviously off doesn't work. It needs to be on. Okay. So what you do in this case with the passives is you set the value to on. Now this field by default is going to be empty and you can edit it and change it to be whatever the value of the passive is, whether it be, you know, resistance in ohms, microfarads, whatever. Okay, so because it's an integrated circuit, we're gonna leave value set to off. Now we need to associate a footprint with this. So we're gonna click new and I can say local because I'm gonna use something that's already in the library. And I'm gonna pick this one that we made that has the 3D model already associated with it. I'm gonna say, okay. You'll see it shows up here. Now, sometimes whenever you see this little gear, it just means it wasn't able to fetch the rendering. Um, sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. Don't let, don't let it throw you off. Um, oftentimes you'll exit and you'll come back in and it'll show up properly. The final thing we need to do is we need to make the connections, okay? So let's click on connect. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go ahead and map pins to pads. Now you'll notice here that we have these G$1, G$2 for the gates. Maybe you don't want to see them named like that. What you can do is over here, you can change the names using the name command. I'll make this A. I'll make this one B. And I'll make this, you know, P for power. Okay. And what's going to happen is when you bring this into the schematic, you're going to get IC1A, IC1B, IC1P. Now, another convention that we typically recommend is don't have the power pins just come in automatically. Um, we know that for users, new users, it can be confusing. You know, where are the power pins? But by setting them to request, it allows you to move more quickly in the actual schematic design process because you don't have to grab this symbol and then relocate it to another sheet immediately or have it off in space somewhere. So what we recommend is to change the add level. So if you look here, you have a swap level, which is the same as it was in the, in the symbol editor. Zero means it's unique. Numbers greater than zero means that any gates that have the same swap level are interchangeable. We know that these two are interchangeable. So in this case, we're going to change the swap level to be one for these. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use the change command. We're going to select swap level. I'm going to pick one and I'm going to click on A and B. And what you'll see is swap one, swap equals one. This means that these two components can be interchanged. Now the add level is a bit more involved. The default is next, which basically means it'll come in in order. I see one A, I see one B, and then I see one P. But we want this one to be on a request basis. We wanna be able to put it into a secondary sheet once we're ready for that part of the process. So what we'll do is we go here and we'll pick add level. Now, if you notice, there's different add levels. Request is the one we're interested in for the power pins. The others have some have functionality that's special. Most of the time, you'll only ever use next and request. The others typically are used whenever you're dealing with the relay. Always means that that gate always has to come in. So in the design, if you're gonna delete it, you have to make sure to delete that one along with any other gates that you wanna get rid of because that one always has to be there. Um, similar results with must and can, okay? but. For now, just focus on next and request. Those are the ones you're gonna use most of the time. So at this point, we have the device here happy. This is all set up correctly. We go to connect and you'll see now that we have gate name. So the plus pin of the A gate might the invert, the inverted pin of the A gate, so on and so forth. Okay, 
Now here I recognize that I made a mistake because I did not name these and I should have. So I'm gonna go ahead and correct that. Let's go ahead and do that. Go to our OTA symbol. We'll call, well, we can use the name command for this. It'll go faster if we use name. So this is diode bias. This is amp input bias. And again, I'm writing the full thing. You don't have to. And this is just the output. I'll abbreviate that without. And there we are. Now what we'll do is we'll go back to the device. Say OK. And now when we go to connect, everything looks the way we expect it to. So at this point, what you would do is you would try to match the pins to the pads. OK, and you would get that from the data sheet. So if we look over here, you can see where everything is supposed to match. And you can see here we didn't do these. We didn't create the, the buffers. So we're not gonna we're not gonna be too concerned about matching this exactly. But obviously when you do it for your own designs, you're gonna want to match the correct pin to the right pad. So let's go ahead and just go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna kind of go in order. Now there's a couple of things that are interesting here. You notice that right now, because we didn't do those, uh, those buffers, those transistor buffers, we now have extra pads. That's okay. In many components, you'll have unconnected pads or, or multiple pads that go to the same place. That's okay. What you can never have is more pins than you do pads. Eagle won't actually let you associate a component that has less pads than there are pins in the symbol. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. So for here, let's say we do wanna assign multiple pads to a connection, let's say like ground. So let me get there. Okay, so for ground, let's say we have three pads that go to ground and three pads that go to VCC. What you would do is you would, you could select them, you know, hold shift and it'll select those and hit connect. That will work. I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect them. Another option is that you can connect the first one and then append the other two. It'll append to the last connection that was made. So either workflow is acceptable. You'll notice when you do that, that now you have this little symbol here and you have an arrow that shows you the various pads that have been connected to this pin, okay? This symbol is important. Right now, by default, it's set to all, which means that in order for Eagle to be happy that this pin has been connected, you have to connect to all three pads, okay? Now, for many components, those multiple pads are already connected internally. So as long as you connect to one of them, the circuit will work. In those situations, you click this little icon and you'll see that it's gonna change. It's now gonna become any. And what this means is that as long as any of these three pads is connected, they're all connected and Eagle's happy. Okay. So that's how this feature works. It's very useful when dealing with large components. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just finish off and connect this one over here. I'll say, okay. And again, it's okay to have pads left over. Say okay, and you'll see, it's hard to see, but there's a little green check mark there. Okay, if I had another package variant, you would see that there's a green check mark there, indicating that I've properly connected everything and everything is good. So at this point, you can go ahead and save. You'll see that you have edits, library, create new version, create. Now, we really, wanted to make sure that no matter what, you were always creating new versions. So even if you don't make any changes, if you go file save, oh, okay, so they did, they corrected that. It used to be that hitting save would always show plus edits, but they've corrected it so that it doesn't, uh, I'll always show it if nothing has changed in the library. Okay, so at this point, this library is, is, is ready. This component is ready to use, obviously. A library can contain as many devices as you want in it. It's not restricted to just one. 
Um, and for some users, they have huge single libraries. I'm, I'm aware of one user that has this one massive library and that's the only library he'll use. And it's got, I don't know how many thousands of components in it. So it's all a matter of how, how you wanna choose to work. Okay. Thank you, Jorge, for that. That's awesome. That's great. Um, I don't see any questions right now, but I did provide the the email address where they could actually reach out to us. I also wanted to mention you could look up the Eagle Forum uh, page as well, Eagle Forum, uh, out of this Eagle Forum, and you could uh, post any questions there as well. Um, sorry about that in the beginning. I was not able to do the demo, but Jorge did a phenomenal job as always. So thank you for that, Jorge. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, and the only, the only thing I wanted to add on is, um, uh, if you do have the manufacturer specification sheet and you have a list of the pins of the, of the pinout, you're able to copy paste that into the schematic editor and the, the, the pins will appear. I'll go ahead and make a video of that, a short one, a little short tutorial to show you how that works. It's actually very useful, um, to create the schematic symbol, almost uh, with a few mouse clicks so it will not have a nice triangle shape like Jorge is but if you want something that's kind of like a rectangular it's uh, pretty useful so thank you for joining us thank you for being here it's been a pleasure uh, and see you next Tuesday everybody have a great day and uh, stay safe thank you Jorge bye everyone take care <laughs>